Good evening, hello and welcome. You're with the news today, your primetime destination news. Newsmakers talking points Friday night. Let's tell you what we have first with the nine headlines at nine tonight. Outrage on the streets. Kashmir pundits resign from government offices over Rahul Bhatt's death. The government employee shot dead by terrorists. Congress leaders assemble in Udaipur for a three-day manthan after a series of electoral reverses. One family, one ticket rule among the suggestions made by the leadership. But the leadership issue of the Gandhis is not on the agenda. Supreme Court rejects plea of the mosque panel on Gyan Vapi, refuses to stay survey at the disputed site in Varanasi. Survey set to resume tomorrow. Language war gets a twist after Tamil Nadu minister strokes a controversy, says those who speak Hindi are Pani Puri sellers. AIMIM's Akbaruddin Ovesi visits Aurangzeb's tomb to pay his respects. BJP and Shiv Sena lash out, say open provocation by paying homage to a Mughal Hindu hater ruler. Bulldozer politics peaks in the national capital. Amadmi Party's open dare to the Delhi BJP chief threatens to bulldoze the alleged encroachment at Adesh Gupta's house. No relief for neat aspirants as the Supreme Court dismisses a plea seeking delay in the postgraduate medical exam. Supreme Court says postponement would disturb patient care and the exam cycle. Once the world's fourth biggest cryptocurrency, Terra Luna, crashes to zero, delisted from major cryptocurrencies, all cryptocurrencies now in free fall. And billionaire Elon Musk halts $44 billion Twitter deal in a surprise announcement. Deal put on hold, pending calculation of fake accounts, but reiterates commitment to acquisition. But let's turn to the breaking news that's coming in at the moment. Kashmiri Pandit government employees serving in the Kashmir Valley have submitted a mass resignation application to the JNK LG Manoj Sinha. The mass resignation by more than 350 Kashmiri Pandits comes a day after a Kashmiri Pandit employee, Rahul Bhatt, was shot dead by terrorists. Employees have questioned their safety. Pandits say they don't feel safe after the killing of Rahul Bhatt by terrorists yesterday in Badgam. Joining me now is our correspondent on the ground, Sunil Ji Bhatt with more. Sunil Ji, how do we interpret this threat that has been given? Is it a threat or are they intent to act upon it saying they need greater security after the brutal murder of Rahul Bhatt? Well, Rajdeep, as far as this mass resignation application is concerned, the Kashmiri Pandit government employees who are serving in the valley are under uh, you know a lot of you know tension right now and they are feeling insecure they are uh, saying that they are not safe in the kashmir valley and this is something which they have been saying for a long time uh, they want that they should be moved out of the valley they should be adjusted in jammu region they should be given jobs in jammu region because in kashmir valley they are not safe and particularly in last two three years we have seen a number of killings of the minority kashmiri pandit community in the kashmir valley now these employees are on a mass agitation. Today also we saw this was one of the rarest of the rare moment that handful of Kashmiri Pandits who are staying in the valley took to the streets. They protested against the government, against Pakistan, against uh, their local administration. They are saying that despite their repeated pleas, the local administration is not paying heed to their uh, you know, demands. They want that government must seriously look into the problems and the uh, sufferings of the Kashmiri Pandit community and try to mitigate it as soon as possible. The JNK administration so far has now taken a step. It has promised that a job will be given to Rahul Bhatt's wife. But the uh, employees who are serving in the valley, they want that government must immediately move them out of the valley because they are not safe in Kashmir right. Valley. And Rajdeep, uh, the patience of the Kashmiri Pandit community is running out. They feel that in the last eight years, even Modi government hasn't done enough to mitigate their suffering. They feel betrayed, not only by the government, but also by the civil society of the nation. They feel that, that they are not just the victims of terrorism. They are also victims of the so-called liberal class who have been providing ideological cover to terrorism and separatism in the Kashmir Valley. Rajdeep.
The fact is, uh, uh, Sunil, every government over the last 30 years has been promising security to the uh, uh, Kashmiri Pandits and we've had governments of the National Conference, we've had PDP governments, we've had Congress-supported governments, we've had BJP-supported governments and now you've got the central rule through the LG. The fact is, in the face of terror, Kashmiri Pandits have remained soft targets. After the brutal murder, in fact, of Kashmiri Pandit Rahul Bhatt, the valley is in a state of unrest. While politicians are speaking out and supporting the Kashmiri Pandits, whether it is Mehbooba Mufti, Omar Abdullah, even Priyanka Gandhi has now spoken out, the fact is, on the streets, there is no protection for the Kashmiri Pandit community. Today, many of them took to the streets to protest against the brutal killing. A brutal murder. A massive protest. And a major political face-off. The Kashmir Valley is once again in a state of unrest over the horrific murder of a Kashmiri Pandit Rahul Bhatt by Pakistan-backed radical Islamist terrorists. 350 Kashmiri Pandit workers submitted their mass resignation to the Jammu and Kashmir Lieutenant Governor Manoj Sinha saying they felt unsafe in the valley. Rakas erupted in Jammu when the Kashmiri Pandit community took to the streets and staged an angry demonstration against the targeted killings by terrorists. They blocked the Srinagar Jammu National Highway. The police fired tear gas shells at protesters to prevent them from moving towards the airport road in Badgam. Rahul Bhatt, a JNK administration officer, was shot dead at point-blank range inside the Tehsil office in Badgam on Thursday. Though he was taken to hospital, he died of the gunshot injuries. His mortal remains arrived in Jammu for the last rites. Narrating the horrific incident, Bhatt's wife Meenakshi said her husband never felt safe in Badgam and that he had repeatedly requested for a transfer to the district headquarters to a safer location. I was telling him, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, we don't want to go there. I know that you know all the places there, you know all the places there. He said, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm not going to go there. No one will go there, 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 no one will go there. Politics over the daylight murder by terrorists has escalated. JNK BJP chief blamed Pakistan-backed terrorists for the killings. ये पाकिस्तान के जो कायर आतंकवादियों ने घटना की है, इसके विरुद्ध पूरे जम्मू कश्मीर में पूरे हिंदुस्तान में गुस्सा है। इन सभी कायर पाकिस्तानी आतंकवादियों को जमीन के पाताल से निकाल निकाल कर इनको मौत के घाट उतारेंगे। हमें भी इस चीज का दुख हो रहा है, और इस प्रकार की घटनाएं होने से कहीं ना कहीं जो शांति प्रक्रिया का प्रोसेस चल रहा है, उसमें कई अर्चन आती हैं। लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि जल्द ही इन लोगों का जो गुस्सा है कश्मीरी पंडित मलाजमों को सुरक्षा के साथ किस प्रकार से हम करें इसके लिए केंद्र में भी बात की जाएगी और लज्जा जी एडमिशन से भी बात की जाएगी। Stressing that Pakistan should not be blamed for the killings in Kashmir, Shiv Sena MP Sanjay Raut demanded a thorough investigation into the killing. मुझे लगता है गृह मंत्री को इस बारे में बहुत ही गंभीरता से सोचना होगा। ये जो चल रहा है कश्मीर में फिर एक बार ये क्या साजिश है बार बार कश्मीर की तरफ उंगली मत उठाइए पाकिस्तान की तरफ उंगली मत उठाइए हम क्या करने जा रहे हैं कश्मीरी पंडितों के लिए ये बहुत ही अहम सवाल है पीडीपी चीफ महबूबा मुफ्ती अपील टू द पीपल ऑफ कश्मीर टू स्टैंड विद कश्मीरी पंडित्स एंड सिक्स शी ऑल्सो आज पीपल टू प्रे फॉर हिंदू मुस्लिम यूनिटी मैं अपने तमाम लोगों से इल्तिजा करती हूं कि आज जुम्मे के दिन तमाम मस्जिदों में हिंदू मुस्लिम बाईचारे की हिफाजत की पुरजोर वकालत की जाए और साथ ही मैं जो जम्मू कश्मीर का जो बाईचारा है जो जम्मू कश्मीर का जो इतिहास रहा है जो हिस्ट्री रही है कि हम इकट्ठे रहने वाले लोग हैं एक सेकुलर स्टेट है पूरे मुल्क को मैसेज दें ताकि मुल्क में 
जो इस वक्त सरकार है उनको मुसलमानों को बदनाम करने का मौका ना मिले 32 years have passed but nothing has changed for Kashmiri pundits the handful of Kashmiri pundits who are left in the valley are being targeted now and we are witnessing a fresh spate of killings of the members of the minority community in the Kashmir valley the Kashmiri pundit community is saying nf is nf how long do they have to suffer the punishment of being hindus in kashmir with video journalist neeraj kumar this is sunil bhat reporting from jammu for india today To the other big breaking story that's coming in from the political world where Congress leaders Kapil Sibal and Gujarat Congress leader Hardik Patel have now skipped the party's all important Chintan Shivir in Udaipur where all the major Congress leaders have gathered. Remember Kapil Sibal had called for a non-Gandhi to lead the party while Hardik Patel had expressed displeasure with the functioning of the Gujarat Congress. There has been speculation that Hardik Patel could exit the Congress. Remember Gujarat goes to the polls at the end of the year so Sibal staying away so his Hardik Patel and he is about to break his silence on the issue let's listen in now And joining me now is the Gujarat Congress working president uh, Hardik Patel whose absence from the Congress Chintan Shivir has uh, sparked up a controversy Hardik bhai aap Chintan Shivir mein nahi gaye uske bajaye aap Ahmedabad mein baithe hain log keh rahe hain ki aap ruthe hue hain aap taiyari kar rahe hain ab BJP mein join karne ab Congress se up gaye bahut ho gaya isliye aap Chintan Shivir mein nahi gaye kyon nahi gaye Udaipur mein baki sab neta hain wahan देखिए पहली बात कि उप गए हैं नहीं गए उसके पीछे का रीजन यही है कि मेरे कार्यक्रम पहले से सामाजिक समाज के लगे हुए हैं और एक एक महीने पहले से एक जो प्राण प्रतिष्ठा महोत्सव होते हैं मंदिरों के और उसमें नहीं जाते तो मैसेज गलत जाता है तो स्वाभाविक है पहले क्या कि पहले उस कार्यक्रमों में जाना जरूरी था कल चिंतन शिविर में जाएंगे जरूर और रुठना बुठना ऐसी कोई बात नहीं है लेकिन स्वाभाविक है कि पार्टी के भीतर जब बड़ी पार्टी होती बड़ा परिवार होता है तो छोटा मोटा मन मुटाव रहता है और ऐसे छोटे मोटे मन मुटाव समय आने पर ठीक हो जाते हैं नहीं नहीं छोटे मोटे मन मुटाव अपने आप है पहले दिन चिंतन शिविर है वहां जाने के बजाय आप अपने कार्यक्रम में लगते हैं मैसेज तो जाता है ना कि कहीं ना कहीं हार्दिक हार्दिक रूठे हुए ये आप इनकार मत कीजिए कि आप पूरी तरह से खुश है <laughs> नहीं 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 ऐसे देखिए वो तो सबको मालूम है कि क्यों नाराजगी है वो तो पार्टी के हाईकमान तक भी हमारी बात रखी हुई है कोई पद पाने के लिए नाराजगी नहीं है कि हमको वो बना दो फलाना बना दो हमारी बात तो जो पार्टी के भीतर हमने रखी है वो वर्क के लिए रखी है कि मैं क्या, क्यों, क्यों नाराज है हमें बताइए क्यों नाराज है हार्दिक पटेल नाराज क्यों है देखिए दो साल से आपने हमको वर्किंग प्रेसिडेंट बना रखा है तो दो साल से आपने अभी तक हमारी जिम्मेवारी तय क्यों नहीं की सिर्फ पद देना बड़ी बात नहीं होती पद के बाद उसके लिए उसका उपयोग करना काम देना उस काम में मैं सफल रहू ना रहू वो देखना वो आपकी जिम्मेवारी होती जो आज तक नहीं हुआ बस उसी का दुख है कि हमने दो हजार में इतने बड़े आंदोलन के बाद जब पार्टी को फायदा दिलवाया पार्टी को मजबूती दिलवाई और फिर आज हमारे साथ ये होता है तो कभी कभी दुख होता है और हमने आज तक पार्टी को सौ टका दिया है पार्टी से कुछ लिया नहीं है कि पार्टी से ले लिया और फिर हम कुछ काम ना किया हमने पूरा काम पार्टी को दिया है पूरा काम करना चाहते हैं तो वही बात होती है और उसी कारण थोड़ा दुख लगता है इसमें कोई नाराजगी नहीं है दुख आ, आपकी राहुल गांधी से बात हुई अभी राहुल गांधी गुजरात में थे आपकी डायरेक्ट बात हुई है नाराजगी जो आप आज शो पे कह रहे हैं उनके सामने रखी आपने देखिए उनको मैंने पंद्रह सत्रह दिन पहले बात की थी उनको मैंने मेरी जो परेशानी थी मुझे मेरा जो दुख था उन तक मैंने पहुंचाया है अभी जो दाहोद आए थे कार्यक्रम में तब तो कोई बातचीत नहीं हो पाई क्योंकि वो व्यस्त थे पांच एक घंटे का कार्यक्रम था जिसमें तीन चार प्रोग्राम को खत्म करना था तो उस हिसाब से बात नहीं हुई लेकिन पंद्रह तारीख को जब ये चिंतन शिविर खत्म हो जाएगी तो मुझे लगता है कि जरूर वो इस मुद्दे पर इस विषय पर सकारात्मक बातचीत करेंगे और उसका हल निकालेंगे मैं आपको डायरेक्ट सवाल पूछता हूं क्या हार्दिक पटेल बीजेपी में जाने की गुजरात के चुनाव पे पहले बीजेपी या आम आदमी पार्टी दोनों में जाने की कोई संभावना है जिस तरह से आपने कुछ ट्वीट्स किए हैं उससे लगता है कि अब आप बीजेपी के साथ भी उतनी दुश्मनी नहीं रही और आम आदमी पार्टी के लोग भी हमें कहते हैं कि हार्दिक पटेल तैयार है बिल्कुल हमारे साथ आने के लिए 
कौन सा ट्वीट मैंने तो ऐसा कोई ट्वीट किया ही नहीं है राजीव जी <laughs> ये आप... तो सिर्फ बातें होती रही थी देखिए जब कोई मैंने कहा कि भाई मेरी ये नाराजगी है ये मेरी परेशानी ये मेरा दुख है तो फिर हर कोई अटकले लगाना शुरू कर देता है फलाना भाजपा आम आदमी पार्टी तो वो तो अलग चीज है कि हर किसी को अपने अपने सूत्र के हवाले से अफवाह फैलाने का अधिकार है उसमें मैं खुल के कोई बात करना नहीं चाहता आपसे लेकिन आप मुझे आश्वासन दे सकते हैं या आप हमें बताइए न्यूज पॉइंट की चुनाव हो रहे हैं नवंबर दिसंबर में गुजरात में उस चुनाव में हार्दिक पटेल कांग्रेस में ही रहेंगे या कहीं और भी जा सकते हैं नहीं 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 ऐसी कोई जाने की बात ही नहीं अगर पार्टी के नेताओं से बातचीत होगी पार्टी के जो विभिन्न मुद्दे हैं जो परेशानी है उस पर हल निकल जाएगा तो ऐसी तो कोई बात ही नहीं होती ना हम तो चाहते हैं कि हम पार्टी के भीतर रहकर प्रदेश की जनता की उम्मीदों पर राजदीप जी खड़े उतरे और हमने अपने सात साल के सामाजिक और राजनीतिक जीवन में कभी कुछ पाया नहीं है सिर्फ और सिर्फ पाया है तो जनता का प्यार पाया और इसीलिए आज बिना कोई पॉलिटिकली बैकग्राउंड बिना कोई पॉलिटिकल फैमिली हम अपनी जमीन यहाँ मजबूत करके रखे हैं क्यों क्योंकि जनता का प्यार है हम ईमानदारी से लगातार लोगों के बीच जाते हैं राजनीति का मतलब क्या है एसी रूम में बैठ कर ड्राफ्ट तैयार करना नहीं लोगों के बीच जाना लोगों की तकलीफें सुनना उनकी समस्याओं को सुनना उनकी समस्याओं का समाधान करना और वो काम कर रहे हैं तो आप, आप जो कहा कि हम कहा देखेंगे अभी तो हम यही है और यही रहना चाहते हैं अभी तो हम यही है मैं इसलिए पूछ रहा हूं क्योंकि 22 अप्रैल को ये अटकलें लगाई गई वेन यू प्रेज द बीजेपी लीडरशिप आपने बीजेपी लीडरशिप की प्रशंसा की और कहा आई एम अ प्राउड हिंदू तब ये जब कहा गया लोगों ने कहा यार अब हार्दिक तैयार हो रहा है बीजेपी में जाने के अच्छा अरे अरे हिंदू होने पर गर्व होना तो क्या उसका मतलब ये होगा कि बीजेपी में चले गए राजीव जी आप भी खरे आदमी हो यार <laughs> अगर अगर मैं ये कहता हूँ हम तो रघुवंशी कुल के लोग हैं हम तो हिंदू होने पर हमें बिल्कुल गर्व है हम तो भगवान राम की आप मेरे घर पे आइएगा तो तीन फुट के भगवान राम की प्रतिमा हम अपने हमारे घर में रखते है रामनवमी पर हमारे घर में पूजा होती रहती है तो ये कोई ये लिंक करने वाली बात नहीं है और बात रही कि हमने किसी की तारीफ की थी कि राजनीति में राजदीप भाई दुश्मन की भी कुछ चीजों पर हमें समझ रखनी पड़ेगी उसकी बातों को समझना पड़ेगा और तभी तो राजनीति हो सकती है ना अगर मैंने कुछ बात कही अगर मैंने कहा कि फलाने लोग पूरी एक्टिविटी या पूरी तैयारी के साथ काम करते हैं तो हमें उसमें ध्यान रखना चाहिए नथिंग सो यू आर सेमोरो यू विल गो टू द चिंतन शिविर आप वहां लोगों से मिलेंगे और राहुल गांधी को अगले हफ्ते मिलेंगे यानी ये कहा जाए कि हार्दिक okay. पटेल तैयारी कर रहे हैं कांग्रेस को छोड़ने के लिए ये गलत खबर है राइट right? देखिए हमने राहुल जी को अपनी जो बात थी वो अपनी बात हमने रख दी है हमने प्रियंका जी को भी बात रखी है महासचिव वेणुगोपाल जी को भी बात रखी है और अब अब उनका जवाब सुनना है हमें तो हमारी बात रख दी और देखिए राजदीप भाई हम वो पॉलिटिक पॉलिटिकल आदमी नहीं कि चुनाव है तो पार्टी पर दबाव करे हमने तो ये कहा कि वर्किंग प्रेसिडेंट का पद ले लीजिए आप हमें काम दीजिए बिना पद पर भी पद पर रहे बिना भी हम काम कर सकते हैं कार्यकर्ता के रूप में काम करेंगे देखिए काम तो देना पड़ेगा ना छह महीने चुनाव के बच्चे हैं आप सिर्फ निगलेक्ट करते रहोगे आपको इम्पोर्टेंट मीटिंग में नहीं बुलाओगे आप एक, एक वर्किंग प्रेसिडेंट रूम में सिर्फ एक गुजरात में उसकी फोटो भी आप नहीं लगा सकते तो दुख तो जरूर होगा ना कि या फिर तो फिर पद क्यों दिया है समझिए आप पद की तो आपका गुस्सा आपका गुस्सा आपके स्टेट यूनिट के साथ है आपका गुस्सा है कि वहां के नेता जो है वो एक तरह से आपको कोई तवज्जो नहीं दे रहे दे आर नॉट गिविंग यू इंपोर्टेंस राइट मेरे मेरे पहले भी कहा कि मेरी जो नाराजगी वो स्टेट यूनिट के साथ सेंट्रल लीडरशिप से नहीं है लेकिन जब सेंट्रल लीडरशिप को ये सब पता हो और उसके बाद जब उस पर वो डिसीजन ले ले तब मुझे उनसे कोई नाराजगी नहीं है लेकिन मैं ये चाहता हूँ कि सेंट्रल लीडरशिप इस मामले में अपना आ, क्या बोलते बोलते कि बीच में आए अपनी बात रखे और कहीं ना कहीं स्टेट लीडरशिप से कहे कि भाई आप ऐसा मत कीजिए राइट right. सो so, आपने एक तरह से बातों बातों में मुझे इशारा दे दिया है कि बॉल इज इन द सेंट्रल लीडरशिप ऑफ द कांग्रेस इज कोर्ट हार्दिक पटेल चाहे नाराज हैं स्टेट यूनिट से बट ही विल टेक अ फाइनल डिसीजन ओनली आफ्टर ही मीट्स राहुल गांधी एम आई करेक्ट यस फाइनल डिसीजन आफ्टर मीटिंग राहुल गांधी ओके हार्दिक पटेल देखते हैं आप क्या डिसीजन लेते हैं चुनाव में केवल छह महीने रह गए हैं गुजरात में सबकी नजर एक तरह से आप पर भी रहेगी थैंक यू वेरी मच हार्दिक पटेल हमसे बात करने के लिए बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू हार्दिक पटेल जॉइनिंग अस देयर फ्रॉम अहमदाबाद रिमेंबर ऑल द एक्शन फॉर द कांग्रेस इज इन उदयपुर वे सोनिया गांधी लॉन्च अ स्केदिंग अटैक ऑन द बीजेपी ऑन द फर्स्ट डे ऑफ द पार्टीज चिंतन शिविर लिसन इन बाय नाउ 
it has become abundantly and most painfully clear what Prime Minister Modi and his colleagues really mean by their frequently repeated slogan, maximum governance, minimum government. It means keeping the country in a state of permanent polarization, compelling people to live in a constant state of fear and insecurity. It means viciously targeting, victimizing, and often brutalizing minorities who are an integral part of our society and are equal citizens of our republic. It means using our society's age-old pluralities to divide us and subverting the carefully nurtured idea of unity in diversity. It means threatening and intimidating political opponents, maligning their reputation, jailing them on flimsy pretext, misusing investigative agencies against them. It means eroding the independence and professionalism of all institutions of democracy. Ukraine war puts economy in hot zone. Inflation surges across the globe. Retail inflation at eight-year high in India. More rate hikes on the cards. Rupee slides against dollar. Stock markets on a roller coaster. From kick-starting demand to killing demand. Will price rise track down growth? Economy Code Red. To our special focus, the wolf of inflation has firmly arrived. The future is here, the future is now. With those sharp words, last week, leading Indian corporate Uday Kotak set the cat among the pigeons. A mix of Covid, Putin, Ukraine, oil prices, supply constraints threatens to derail the growth story across the world. This week in India, inflation at 7.7% reached its highest level in eight years, crossing the RBI set limits for a fourth consecutive month. The big question, how much worse could it get? What could be its impact on job creation and growth? What are the solutions? That's what I'm going to be raising with my special panel on the round table. Let's first give you the big question I want to raise. Is this an India problem or is this a global problem? That's going to be the first of many questions I'm going to be raising on this inflation roundtable. Joining me now, Shogoto Bhattacharya, Executive Vice President and Chief Economist at Axis Bank. DK Joshi, Chief Economist at Crystal, Indranil Pan, Chief Economist, Yes Bank. And Professor Arun Kumar, Noted Economist. Let me go to each of you for first quick comments on that question as I'll put up graphics to show it's not just India but across the world, inflation is rising. Professor Bhattacharya, what's your sense? Is India simply following a global pattern at the moment? So, absolutely, you put it very succinctly, Rajdeep. Uh, so, this is a global problem. I mean, in, in the US, a 40 year problem. Uh, I'm talking about inflation. In the Eurozone, about a 30, 35 year problem. So, it's across the world. The only exception being China. Uh, so, other than that, so I'll, I'll come in later. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, this is uh, a large supply shock, a series of supply shocks, as you mentioned, uh, coming in. But together with this, I also sense uh, that India's demand conditions are also fairly resilient. Uh, so, I mean, just just see that, I mean, you know, I mean, the two and a half years of inflation at, at pretty much these levels, I mean, 6%, five and a half, six percent 6%, there has to be a demand component. Uh, so, obviously, I mean, the supply shocks that are feeding in 
he is getting absorbed uh, from some sources, uh, whatever the source of demand. Uh, and and this, so right now, this is a combination of demand absorbing the series of supply shocks that have come in. But yes, you're absolutely right that this is mm -hmm. coming in uh, via commodities, via food, via, via edible oils, via the entire energy complex uh, from a whole source of uh, foreign, foreign uh, shocks coming in. The system. Let me get in, Professor Arun Kumar, you, uh, your view, is this... Uh, is this a global problem? Can the government or the policy makers get away by saying, look, it's not just India, it's happening across the world, don't single India out? So, Rajdeep, uh, yes, of course, uh, it's a global problem because they are a globalized economy. Uh, things are coming from outside, there's no doubt. Even prior to the war, you know, there were supply shocks and uh, price of metals and energy, etc. were rising uh, and they have started rising even faster. And what the current inflation data shows that they're accelerating. Our wholesale price index was rising at above 10% for now roughly 13 months. And that also is feeding into other you know, inflation, not just into fuel and food. Uh, mm -hmm. So therefore, it's a generalized inflation that is increasing in the Indian context. And let me say that the demand has not yet come back. Our uh, current uh, output is not yet back to the 2019 level, uh, even if we look at the official data. Uh, because the consumer uh, confidence index which the RBI puts out, that largely refers to the organized sector, that is still down to about 72, whereas prior to the pandemic, it was at 105. So if the consumer confidence is not back up, then it means that consumption levels could not be back up to where they were prior to the pandemic. Uh, so demand is short. You know, you can look at, uh, you know, various right. components of demand. Uh, for instance, in the external sector also, we have a huge trade deficit. Uh, and we have a current account deficit, which means that demand from there also is uh, weak. So overall, demand is weak, and yet prices are rising rapidly. And not only that, the consumer price data that has just come shows that it's accelerating. Uh, it's accelerating as compared to last year. It's accelerating in April compared to March. And because the situation is very uncertain in the coming months, we don't know what will happen in the war situation, how much the you know uh, various uh, supply bottlenecks from Russia, Ukraine, that will continue to plague the world economy, what will happen to sanctions that have been imposed, and that right. may be imposed on other countries that continue to trade with Russia. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And given that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think we cannot predict what will happen to prices and what will happen to growth. But what is clear is that we are headed towards a new Cold War in which there'll be two circles of trade, of technology, and so on. And therefore, you know, supply disruption will continue. Uh, China facing pandemic at the moment, supply disruptions are pretty large from there, and they are the manufacturing hub of the world. So that is likely to continue. So, so you're saying worried. inflation I, I, likely I, to persist. Let me stop you. You're saying inflation likely to persist. You don't see it as something which is... Uh, which is going to go away in a hurry, and that's, of course, the concern. Let me come to you, D.K. Joshi, your sense, sir. Do you believe that what we are seeing is potentially persistent inflation, and that could become a major challenge? It's not enough to say it's global. Yes, it's global, but we're going to have to deal with it at home as well. And that's right. I think it's indeed it's a global problem. The reasons do vary across countries. I mean, for instance, just to give you one advanced country example. In US, it is largely because the demand is very strong. I mean, the consumption demand, the labor market. In Europe, it is largely because of energy. So I think situation varies from country to country. In India, I think the it is largely still a supply-driven phenomena because the overall consumption demand is not that strong. I mean, it is picking up, but it's not that strong. I, the interesting part is that this is not, inflation is not only rising, it is also becoming broad based and there are whether you look at food you look at fuel or you look at core inflation which excludes food and fuel it's mm -hmm. across the board and i think uh, the uh, uh, the the pressure is uh, is going to stay for some time at least i think now uh, this uh, the one uh, situation uh, that can bring some relief is if the war ends. But who knows when the war is going to end? I mean, uh, then I think you could see relief on commodity and so you're prices. saying because as long as are you saying that as long as the war in Ukraine persists, you don't see inflation tapering off. Am I correct? No, inflation might taper off uh, at some point, but it's going to remain above the comfort band. I think that's the point. I mean, as long as the because. Uh, the, if you look at uh, crude or commodities, I think by next year, 
they will fall from these levels. I mean, even if I think they war or no war, but the point, so inflation will look negative for many of these items. I mean, but the point is overall inflation will still remain uncomfortable till we have a, a significant right. reduction in, in crude commodity uh, prices. Anirban Pan, are we seeing a possibility of a prolonged period of inflation, which should be a be of great concern at the moment? Uh, definitely, in inflation is of concern. Uh, 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 having said that, I think let's look at it in a slightly different way, in the sense that uh, these supply constraints have not evolved overnight. Uh, the supply constraints are definitely not with respect to just the war. It is also with respect to how China uh, sort of was moving its economy towards uh, towards less polluting industries and therefore had to close down some of the industries. It is also uh, to a certain extent with respect to how the global, especially in terms of the shale gas uh, uh, capital investments, uh, that had paused and some of the, uh, the shale ga uh, gl gas units had to be closed down because uh, oil prices has, had crashed at that point in time. So it's a combination of not only the war, but a significant buildup of supply constraints over the years. Uh, it's very difficult to understand how this inflation channel will end. Uh, in my opinion, possibly at certain point in time, there will be a, a crack in terms of the demand. The high inflation obviously is unlikely to support uh, private uh, consumption expenditure for long. Today it is getting supported because COVID had provided this opportunity of additional and excess savings being held by the population as, as they were sitting indoors. Now, when that exhausts itself out and when uh, central banks also raise uh, interest rates maybe to uh, unsustainable levels. Uh, that is the point in time I think uh, you can get uh, some uh, hope in terms of inflation coming down. But as I think most of your panelists did right. uh, point out, they will probably be remaining higher than what you had experienced uh, in the global scenario, even post the global financial crisis when central banks had pumped in so much of liquidity and driven rates down uh, to uh, uh, even sub-zero levels in certain conditions. Who is inflation hurting the most is the second question that we want to raise on the round table. Who is inflation hurting the most? You know, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, there's a sense that the middle class is the one at the, at the moment which is really getting hit. Uh, incomes have been down in COVID times. There's been a job crisis and now comes inflation. It comes at a time when we just when we thought we were getting out of the COVID trap comes inflation to haunt us. How do you see it? Is that the big question mark that the middle class is hurting or as Professor Arun Kumar and others probably will say, those in the unorganized sector? No, so the first point of hurt of inflation, and we know this, Governor Subarao used to say this again and again, uh, that the inflation hurts the poorest the most. There's no doubt about that. So some of the government interventions uh, via food, via some of the other subsidies, uh, is, is some is, is a little bit of a palliative uh, to these, but I mean, their income levels are so low anyway that oh, their savings get wiped out or whatever. But a large part of the mass market demand that we see in India that is so attractive to global investors, etc., does come in from the middle class. Uh, on the upper, I mean, if you see some of the private sector data points, say CMI, uh, if you see some of the data from CMI, uh, income, expenditure, savings are concentrated in the top one, two, three decides. I mean, if you split it in 10 parts, so it's there. Uh, so that part, that those segments are probably not impacted all that much. But it is the middle segment, as you said, the middle class, the average, the median uh, size of the households, mm -hmm. uh, which is the mass, which is the base of the mass demand that we see in the system. And there, exactly as you mentioned, incomes are getting squeezed. Interest rates have gone up, are, are beginning to go up. Prices across the board, as Mr. Joshi men mentioned, uh, across the board have gone up. So it is the consuming part of this part and not just from the consumption demand angle because this mm -hmm. class is probably eating into the savings uh, that they had and that is likely to affect the, the supply of funds. Uh, you know, I mean, the CapEx cycle is just about uh, beginning to rise. I mean, you need the funds and it is this segment, the middle income, not just from a squeeze in demand, but will also squeeze the amount of savings that they will put in by Can banks I or other institutions to fund uh, domestic campaigns. You know, fuel was, has, was on fire, particularly after March, the elections were over. Global oil prices were on the rise after the Ukraine war. Food prices also. 
uh, have been uh, rising, uh, including ATA prices at the highest ever level. And yet, Professor Arun Kumar, we don't see any massive protests uh, of the kind that we saw even in 2013 when the Manmohan Singh government was facing the problem of, uh, of inflation and uh, uh, was battling, in a sense, low growth and inflation. Do you believe that there, will, that there is a sense of where is the unrest? We don't see unrest at the moment despite the high prices. You know, uh, poor people seldom protest on their own. They're organized. So it's a political issue. Uh, when the opposition parties are able to mobilize, then actually you see protest. If the opposition is not able to mobilize, then you don't see protest. But if you look at it, you know, 94% in the unorganized sector have lost incomes and have lost employment. And they are the ones who are hurting. Uh, five kilogram of, uh, you know, food or some gas, etc., does help. But their basic income has gone down. You know, if you look at the price, you, you don't accept. You don't accept. The, you don't accept that the government's targeted schemes, in particular, providing food uh, and food grain in this period, has helped. Of course, that's what I said. That you know, this five kilogram of uh, food and you know, uh, gas supply, etc., does help a little. But overall, incomes are down, and that's why the uh, rest of the consumption is down, and that's why their situation is not what it was earlier. And that's why I was quoting the price survey, which came at the time of the budget, which showed that the bottom 60% in the income categories, they have lost incomes as compared to the pre the, uh, the, uh, you know, demonetization period. It's the top 20% that gave, gained 30% income. I'll also quote to you the uh, socioeconomic survey of Delhi, which came out in 2018, which showed that 90% of Delhiites spend less than 25,000 rupees per month as a family of five and 98% spent less than 50,000 rupees. Now, given that Delhi's per capita income is roughly three times the All India per capita income, that translates to an All India level of roughly 90% family spending less than 10,000 rupees per month. Now, at that level, you know, fuel price increase and other price increases are going to hurt because now we see a generalized inflation in the consumer price index is not just food. It's also textiles. It's also leather goods. It's also other consumption items professor, also in health and so on so professor kumar i just want to stop you i want to stop you for a moment because i want to move very quickly on to solutions as you are saying you believe that the bulk of the population will is hurting uh, the government schemes in terms of free food grains may provide a palliative but not enough so what are the solutions let's turn to you mr joshi first what are the solutions uh, mr joshi that you believe are right to meet the inflation challenge. Is it enough just for the RBI to raise uh, uh, rates and that in itself will ensure that inflation will sooner rather than later taper off? Or do you believe that much more needs to be done? Well, I think RBI needs to act because it is the goalkeeper for inflation. So I think uh, uh, the interest rates will go up, but that's not going to be enough to tame inflation. Fiscal policy also needs to be deployed. And I think we've seen some action on that front. So what I would say that there are two responsibilities of fiscal policy here. One is to uh, tame inflation by cutting duties. I think they have cut mm -hmm. duties on edible, imported edible oils, petroleum products, and more needs to be done for petroleum products, mm -hmm. I would believe, because it has a cascading effect. And second is to address the ill effects of, uh, of inflation on the, on the poorest part of the population. And we do mm -hmm. estimate population by income classes. And I think it's very clear that the the lowest 20% of the population are facing higher inflation than the top 20% in urban areas as well as mm -hmm. in rural areas. So clearly, mm -hmm. I think, and that bottom 20% needs to needs to be helped. I think so what we, and also I think uh, what uh, uh, the other issues that need to be addressed is there's rising cost of uh, of production of food. I mean, the, the, uh, the input for agriculture uh, production have all gone up, whether it is, I think, particularly globally. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to shield the, the, the farmers against the, uh, the, the pressure on, uh, on, on imported fertilizer prices, et cetera, so, which means rising subsidies uh, for fertilizers as well. So I think all these measures need to be uh, uh, deployed, and some of them are being deployed to address the inflation and its right. ill effects. You know, is India better place to meet the inflation challenge is my fifth question, uh, Mr. Pan, because I put in good news and the bad news. We've seen uh, massive uh, foreign exchange outflow flows at the moment. At the same time, uh, we are among the larger economies growing 
albeit from a lower base because of uh, the recessionary years of uh, COVID, uh, but we are growing faster than most other economies at the moment. You've got GST collections up, but at the same time, there are genuine concerns uh, over jobs and incomes, as I said. Are we in a better position to tame inflation than many other countries in the world, or do you believe we also have a long struggle ahead? Uh, I believe we have a long struggle ahead. And I think the simple reason is that the inflation that is manifesting today is food and fuel. Uh, food in the headline CPI itself is uh, is 47% plus fuel. So these actually form bulk of the inflation. So the inflation is more uh, global and, and the cascading effect of that on India is being felt. Uh, so that's that's point number one. Uh, second, in terms of taking uh, Dr. Joshi's point uh, forward, I think the fiscal has a lot bigger role to play in the current scenario uh, than the uh, uh, than the Reserve Bank of India. I understand so that, that there's a six percent. Explain upper that to our viewers target. who'd want to know when you say fiscal has an important part to play. What would you expect the government to do? Yeah, so, so the first thing, obviously, is that uh, the uh, uh, government needs to move ahead and, as uh, Dr. Joshi also pointed out, uh, cut the taxes. So I'm specifically mentioning about the excise uh, uh, duties that they collect on petrol and diesel. So it is not only the center that needs to reduce the taxes, it is also the state governments who need to participate in the process of uh, uh, providing that comfort. Uh, important part is the diesel because diesel has a lot of uh, uh, sort of second round effect in terms of increasing logistics costs. Uh, the other important part is obviously the coal uh, and the impact of that on, uh, say, uh, uh, steel production. So those are some of the cascading effect that I think the government should be able to uh, sort of contain by absorbing a part of the pressure uh, within the budget. Uh, specifically for, for oil, I think uh, they have passed on a certain proportion of the burden onto the consumers. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they need to cut the excise duties. That's the second part. And the oil marketing companies possibly also uh, needs to share in the burden at this point in time. You know, so the oil, the oil, I can tell you the oil marketing companies have just written to the government saying that they are being forced to hold on to prices for the last month because that could take inflation up even further. Uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, do you believe that it's possible to cut excise? Does the government have any headroom, given its revenue uh, situation, to cut uh, taxes on fuel? Uh, Rajdeep, every uh, rupee cut on excise on petrol and diesel uh, will cost the government uh, 16,000 crores. Every rupee cut in petrol, in excise on petrol and diesel is 16,000 crores. Uh, they are uh, the government, and, and, and for the state governments, it's an even further loss because state taxes are what is called ad valorem. So, I mean, it's based on the proportion. The excise cut is just a one rupee, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, there is probably, I, I agree with my, my fellow panelists, uh, mm -hmm. that there is a need for the government uh, to try to control inflation by cutting taxes, customs duties here and there, but mm -hmm. the space is very limited. Uh, because remember, uh, one all your subsidy costs have increased. Fertilizer prices, fertilizer subsidies will have probably doubled uh, from one lakh crores to two lakh crores. Uh, and with 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 the monetary policy, with the RBI coming in and trying to slow the economy down, even revenue collections, the corporate tax collections that uh, saw us through in FY22 last year, uh, even right. that is likely to slow down. So yes, the, the fiscal side, the government, both the center and the states will certainly have a role to play, but the space is getting increasingly limited. Therefore, a final word from you, Professor Arun Kumar. Uh, you've been seen as a critic of this government. What do you see as the biggest challenge and the opportunity, a quick response to that going ahead? How do you see this all pan out in the next few months? Could things get worse before they get better in your view? So, you know, we are in, in a stagflationary situation because the economy has not yet gone back to 2019. Where the now, how do you say stagflation? How do you, how do you say stagflation? When I keep using this word, other economies say, look, we are now growing, we are out of recession. How can so, you say we are in stagflation? Stagflation means that the growth has not taken place compared to 2019. We are still not yet really over the 2019. So, in a sense, there's been no growth in the last two years. So that's a stagnation, whereas the rate of uh, price increase has shot up dramatically and it's likely to go further because there's an acceleration in the CPI, mm -hmm. there's an increase in the WPI. So therefore the inflation is increasing, whereas the growth rate is not. And with the RBI's policies that are coming in, demand is going to be cut short and therefore the rate of growth is going to fall further. So it's not even going to cross 2019 level now. 
and that's why i'm calling it stagflation okay now the question is therefore it, it impacts the poor people the most because they're losing jobs and their their pockets are hurting because of inflation and that's going to further create problems in the economy disparities etc are going to rise so what do we need to do that's the question that you're asking and clearly indirect taxes have to be cut unfortunately the government is thinking of increasing gst it's saying 5% to 8% and from 18% to 28% now some items from 18% to 28% which are like sin goods they may be okay but other goods which are uh, mm -hmm. indirect uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, taxes on uh, uh, basic items or on uh, intermediate items those will be inflationary if you increase on services that will also be inflationary so i think what we need to do is reform gst because the gst is creating a lot of complications and the government is saying they're collecting record amount of gst but that's coming from the organized sector the right. government is also collecting record amount from direct taxes that's corporate tax and income tax that's also coming from the organized sector so what the government is to do is collect more of direct taxes and reduce the indirect taxes the reduction in indirect taxes will take care of at least part of the inflation and therefore the demand would not fall as much as otherwise it would fall so therefore okay. the government is to redo the budget because the budgetary calculations as the other panelists have pointed out expenditures will be higher and your incomes may begin to fall so therefore you need to collect additional taxes from direct taxes so that you can cut indirect taxes so complete package of you know remodeling of the budget is necessary okay let me leave it there uh, mr joshi uh, dr joshi you want 30 seconds to just say are we yeah, really no. in stag i uh, do you fear a stagflation as professor kumar says or is that an exaggeration uh, not at all i mean the it see uh, you are still growing and uh, uh, just to uh, add 21 22 gdp is higher than 2019 20 gdp uh, that is what the cso data shows so actually you've crossed the pre pandemic levels i think the only weak part is the private consumption demand which is only 1.2% above the 2019 20 levels and right. economy is growing i mean it's, it's not stagnation and i think you can say that it's not growing as fast as it should be growing but it is definitely growing fast enough so it's not it's not a stagnationary scenario yes what is true is that you are going to get slower growth and higher inflation i think that is true that that that, that i slower, agree but not not the term in, uh, okay stagflation. so slowing slowing growth and higher inflation which again puts pressure in a sense on the policy makers in the country to come up with solutions as early as possible the economy in a sense remains our top focus thank you all very much for joining me here on the inflation challenge round table it's time for a break on the other side our good news today story and it comes from the national capital we'll tell you more you're watching the news today news without the noise Make your media plan smarter with India Today Live TV on your connected devices. Amplify your brand with 100 million smart internet viewers. To advertise, mail us at sales at ajtag.com or call double nine double nine eight nine two one seven one. curiosité les gens du coup viennent pour voir ce que ça donne après oui euh, dans la pratique euh, on s'affilie pas du tout à, à l'univers Harry Potter on, on utilise euh, les mêmes termes comme soif cognard vif d'or balai euh, 
etc. Mais euh, c'est vraiment devenu un sport à part entière, à la frontière de euh, plusieurs sports collectifs euh, qu'on connaît depuis euh, des centaines d'années. Moi, ce qui me plaît, c'est la mixité, c'est que c'est le, le seul sport de contact où, euh, qui est mix dans les genres. Également l'ambiance, parce que c'est une ambiance vraiment bon enfant. Et également tout le côté euh, complexe, parce que c'est l'un des rares sports où on a vraiment différents postes comme batteur, poursuiveur ou attrapeur. Welcome back, you are with the news today. Our good news today story is about the Matka man of Delhi, a 76-year-old good Samaritan who's providing free drinking water to thousands of people every day, a great relief at a time when a heat wave is sweeping the national capital. I leave you with that good news story. You stay well, stay safe. Good night, Shubhratri, Jai Hind, Namaskar. Temperatures nearing 50 degrees Celsius, the capital is in the grip of a relentless heat wave. In this heat, one man in Delhi has made it a mission to ensure no one goes thirsty. Hey, pump ka on karo. Meet the Matka man. Alagna Trajan, a 76-year-old cancer survivor, wakes up every morning at 5 to fill earthen pots across South Delhi. The retired engineer, who lived abroad for 32 years, returned to India in 2005. He was soon diagnosed with intestinal cancer. But not only did he fight cancer, but also took up the Herculean task of providing free drinking water to the needy. My uh, zodiac sign is water, Aquarius. So maybe from somewhere there, my socha pani may kuch karengi. Rose, abhi my maybe char hazar to, to panch hazar pani lagate. Uh, and the ye pura initiative is my, my, my initiative, my NGO nahi Even the pandemic did not stop the matka man. Natrajan has put up over 100 matkas across Delhi which he fills every 365 days a year. The Delhi Jal Board has provided Natrajan free access to water, but he likes to work alone, without any political associations. Pension, a lifetime savings and donations from Good Samaritans keep Natrajan's initiative going. Your report, India Today. Massive meltdown in Delhi's Jahin Bagh. A lot of push and shove by the angry locals here. They are sitting before the bulldozer and uh, the situation is quite tense. Only channel from the bulldozer's part. Unlike Jahangirpuri, I can tell you it's complete commotion in Shaheen Bagh. The only structure that came down. Bulldozer versus Shaheen Bagh. Uncompromising coverage only on India Today.
In what can be described as the biggest leak in American history, the US Supreme Court could strike down the right to abortion for women. This has sparked widespread protests across the country and comes as a huge blow to women and the right to their bodies in America. So while India is progressing by making amendments to its abortion laws, is the US regressing? In January 1973, the US court decided that the constitutional right to privacy applied to abortion. However, abortion laws vary from state to state. The gestational limit for terminating pregnancy varies between 8 to 12 weeks. Abortion was a criminal offence in India. It was described as intentionally causing miscarriage and could lead to three years in jail. Then the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act was formed in 1971 that legalised abortion. The MTP Act allows for termination of pregnancy up to 20 weeks. Pro-choice supporters believe that one should be able to decide whether to have children or not. On the other hand, pro-life supporters believe that a fetus should be allowed to live. The Indian Supreme Court in 2016 judgment put an end to the debate. The Supreme Court stated that the debate is about life versus life and allowed abortion for rape survivors. Documents published by American media outlet Politico suggest the country's top court is willing to overturn the 1973 decision that legalised abortion nationwide. This would result in women using unsafe alternatives for abortion like coat hangers, chemicals, unskilled abortion providers or other dangerous methods. According to WHO, unsafe abortions kill more than 47,000 people every year. It also shows that banning abortions has little or no effect on abortion rates throughout the world. Countries with restrictive abortion laws have three times higher maternal mortality rates than the rest. And the US would join a very small group of countries that have tightened abortion laws in recent years as opposed to loosening them. Poland, El Salvador and Nicaragua are the only three countries which have restricted their laws since 1994, while in the same period, 59 countries have expanded access and the US could soon be the fourth country on the list. You are watching India. The Russian armed forces are considered amongst the strongest in the world and yet close to 80 days into the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Russia hasn't been able to achieve their strategic aim. And questions are being asked about the losses that the Russian armed forces have suffered, not just the army but the air force and the navy. Why is this happening? Was this poor appreciation of situation on ground, poor intelligence, poor logistics, poor planning? poor execution of plans, there are many questions that need to be answered. Let's talk about the initial phase of the operations. It was on the 24th of February that Russia mounted what it called was special operations into Ukraine. And initially, Ukraine and the world, they were stunned when Russian missiles targeted several VA and VPs or vital assets and vital points in Ukraine. Major airfields were targeted. In fact, in the first week of the conflict, and uh, this is where we were reporting this conflict uh, on, uh, on Ground Zero, 14 airfields across Ukraine were targeted. Ukraine's air force was virtually taken down. A number of radars were taken down. And that is where it was claimed that Russia had complete air supremacy. Not just air dominance, it was claimed Russia had air supremacy. It was said that almost 80% plus or close to 90% of Ukraine's air defences, the S-300 systems, had been taken down. But more than 75 days into the conflict, the S-300 systems continue to operate, 
continue to not just stop incoming Russian missiles, but even successfully take down, as the Ukrainians claim, the most modern Russian aircraft, Russian Air Force aircraft, including the S-34s. And this should be a cause for grave concern for the Russian Air Force. More than two months into the conflict, close to three months into this conflict, they still do not have complete air supremacy over Ukraine's skies. That's one aspect of this war. The second aspect, that long convoy from Belarus that was coming close to Kiev. Again, uh, we were reporting from Irpin and Bucha and Hostomel had travelled to Borodayanka. Uh, of course, this was after the Russians had retreated. But you saw what was often described in Bucha and Irpin as the graveyard of Russian tanks. The Russian T-72s, um, they, were, they, were they were destroyed. Uh, the Kapola had virtually popped up. Uh, there were logistics problems and when we interacted with a number of Ukrainian officers um, and soldiers, it wasn't just the in-laws and the Javelin ATGMs, but it was also poor logistics. Some Armoured Corps officers are talking about um, design flaws in Russian T-72 tanks, uh, lack of protection for soldiers, uh, for tankmen, armoured co uh, soldiers inside tanks uh, because the moment there's a strike, uh, the, the, the weapons and the ammunition inside, uh, that, that creates a big fire, that leads to massive damage and there are virtually no si uh, chances of survival. When it's the world's biggest news story, there's only one gold standard of journalism.